In the name of the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We will continue our study in the Thessalonians, the letter of Thessalonians. We said that the letter of Thessalonians is the first ever letter written, or the first book written in the New Testament. And St. Paul was spending some time answering questions of the people of Thessalonians. We saw that he spent the first few chapters basically talking to them, greeting them first, telling them about the second coming is coming soon, so they can be lifted up in the midst of the persecution because they were a small church, a young church that just believed three month old church and they were under severe persecution. So St. Paul was encouraging them, was giving them comfort, reminding them of the second coming. And then he answered one of their questions in, the, in chapter four earlier. He told them that a lot of the suffering that you're going through is because of your sanctification, because God is trying to make you holy. A lot of times, kiddo, we ask the will of God, and we see the revealed will of God is very clear in Thessalonians. Now, the people of Thessalonians had a very important question. What's the question? The question is, they thought that our Lord Jesus Christ is coming today. This coming, Yanni, this month, okay? So they have a problem. They are under persecution. So a lot of their family members have died. So the question is, what happens to them? They will miss the resurrection of the Lord. They will miss the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For they were very upset. That shows you how lovely those people are. Imagine, kid, that they are worried. Not, not that there is no hope in the resurrection. They're worried that they will not experience the resurrection. The very kind of glorious moment when, a, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with his glory and takes us with him. For St. Paul is answering this question starting from verse 13. He said, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least, least you sorrow as others who have no hope. Taban, we know very well that our Lord Jesus Christ likes to use the word falling asleep for death. There's a lot of similarities between falling asleep and death. Number one, Taban, it's very obvious when you fall asleep, it means you're going to eh, wake up again, right? So there is life. That's why the beautiful prayer in our church, the morning hour, talks about resurrection. And it's a morning hour of praise. Because just like when I die, I will wake up in heaven praising God, as we will see in a little bit. So also the church reminds me every time I sleep, I will wake up in the morning and praise God. So the life of Christians becomes a life of praise. Also, there's a very important question, because this is something that some people brought in as a heresy. Does only the body sleep, or the body and the soul? Is it only the body, or is it the body and the soul? Are you like in a freezer, your soul doesn't move? Or is it only the body? The analogy of falling asleep clarifies that. When you sleep, is your soul sleeping, or is it awake? You have dreams, you have thoughts, your brain does not stop working, right? So our Lord Jesus Christ is saying, look, we are falling asleep. The body, when we die, the body is sleeping. The body is sleeping, but the spirit is still moving. Why is that important? Because it's, it hits at the core of the intercession of the saints. If the soul of the saints are sleeping, how can you intercede with them? Let me, let me tell you, explain something really quick to clarify it. God can shield us when we are in paradise from the suffering of those who are in Hades. Why? Because it's hopeless. Okay? So if, um, if, uh, if God forbid, a brother or a sister or a mother or a child goes to Hades, God might not allow the parents in paradise to see their suffering because it's hopeless. 
And paradise is a place with joy, full of joy. But God will allow us, uh, the souls of the human, the soul of those who are departed, to see those who are still alive. So they can pray for them. Because we are the church of the living. We are the church of the living. That's why we can intercede in the life of Pope Krullus. That's why we can intercede with Saint Mary. That's why we can intercede. And the saints in heaven can still keep their joy. He can tell me it's impossible. How can they keep their joy and see the suffering? I'll tell you very simple. How does God see our suffering and still keep his joy? That he is the source of joy. This mystery will know it when we go to heaven. But I cannot say it's impossible because God himself can do it. And whatever things belong to God, a lot of it, taban, yani, he gives it to his children. Okay? He tells them here, eh, I do not want you to be ignorant. St. Paul, in the way he writes, there are certain things when he wants to get your attention. Okay? When, when somebody is talking to you, Habibi, come here. You know, the voice means, eh, there's something serious coming. Okay? So, I do not want you to be ignorant, means, eh, wake up. There's something very important I want to tell you. There's something Paul is here communicating the faith. What is he saying? He's saying, I do not want to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Let me get a, tell you, people in the ancient time, there are only two kinds of people. There is only the people who worshipped different gods, polytheists or monotheists. Monotheists are the Jews. Polytheists are the Greek and the Romans. Okay? Let's see what some of the Greek and the Romans okay, the, uh, philosophers say. This is one of them. He says, hopes are for the living. The dead are without hope. That's the philosophy. Hope, if you are Greek or Roman, hope are for the living. But eh, the dead have no hope. One philosopher said, I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. And I didn't exist, I came, I died, I don't really care about what happens afterwards. Okay? Even if you guys remember in the book of Acts when St. Paul was in Athens, when he was in Athens, he was preaching to them about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, because the resurrection is the core of our salvation. What did they say? And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. And others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Yani, eh, come later. Come later, man. Eh, okay? It means we don't want to see you. So they made fun of him whenever he brought the idea of resurrection. That's the people that, eh, that are polytheists. Some people, some, like, some people did have, a, have hope at, at uh, eternity, at life afterwards, but one, they had no evidence, and number two, they could not explain it. A lot of people believed in different gods, they believed in, 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 in a divine realm of things, but they could not ever explain what happens after death. What about the Jews? What about the Jews? You say, well, there is hope in the Jews. Let me get a read for you what Jacob said to his children in Genesis 35, 35, 37, 35. He said, for I shall go down into the grave, in other translation, Hades, to my son in mourning. Once he heard the news about Joseph, he told him, eh, for I shall go down into Hades. They knew that when they die, What's going to happen? They will go to Hades. See, in, in one of the Psalms, David said, I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoice. And then he goes here, he said, because you will not abandon to me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your holy one to see decay. He was talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, how he will give him, he was the only one who is not going to see decay. But you see here, the death or the point, that pe the way that people viewed death was very negative. That's why in the Old Testament when God blesses somebody, 
he will give him long age. Okay, Mesan Adam lived over 900 years. Uh, Noah, Motoshel, lots of people lived hundreds of years. Why? Because they're going to go to Hades. <laughs> so they better eh, try to enjoy as much as they can on earth. They better. But he was telling them, look, I am not, I'm not telling you not to be sorrowful because God consecrates the human feeling. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself cried at the tomb of Lazarus, knowing that he will raise him from the dead. But he cried because he respects the human feeling and he participates in them. But he's telling them there's a different mourning. There's a different tears. There's a tear with hope and a tear without hope. There are a tear with hope and there are a tear without hope. That's why it's very important here when St. Paul tells them, I do not want you to be ignorant. He's really clarifying wrong teaching. Some wrong teaching can be killers, can really kill people, can confuse them so much. And unfortunately, with the times we're in right now, there are so many wrong teaching. And what happens is people are convinced of certain ideas and it leads into destruction. I was telling uh, one of the youth earlier today, I was telling him, for example, some people believe in the idea of the millennium, that Jesus will come and reign for a thousand years, like it said in the book of Revelation. People believe that Jesus will come on earth and reign for a thousand of years. But when the Antichrist comes, how would you know this is Jesus or this is the Antichrist? Wrong teaching that could lead people to destruction. When somebody teaches people, for example, that you are justified by faith alone, and then takes out all the verses that talks about faith without work is dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ in the second coming says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. How can you teach that? Then you're taking people in the way of destruction taking people in the way of ignorance. Here it says in verse 14, it said, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if even so God will bring him, will bring with him those who sleep in Christ. So he's saying, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Christ. Why is the resurrection of Christ a very important idea here? The problem was never raising people. Okay? Everybody will be raised. The issue is being raised as a Christian. Okay? And yani, yani, what happens is, is God has the power to raise people from the dead. Right? People were raised in the dead from the Old Testament and people were raised in the dead in the New Testament. It's not an issue. That happened before the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what didn't happen before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? That nobody died and entered paradise. So when I say I died in Christ, that means I have the hope to enter paradise. That's why the death and resurrection of Christ is critical. That's why, that's why we call our Lord Jesus Christ eh, the first fruit to heaven. The first person to enter the holies of holies. And when I am in Christ, I get to take what belongs to Christ. Something very interesting in this verse. Look at, the, like, eh, look at this verse. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died... Jesus eh, died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Christ. So he described Jesus with death and described us with a eh, falling asleep. How can you say that? What's the difference? Why is he saying that we as Christian only falling asleep and Christ died? 
Because our Lord Jesus Christ, he faced death on our behalf. So because Jesus faced death on our behalf, and you sleep kada eh, middalla. There's no more kada death and pain and suffering. La la. The enter you sleeping like a child in the bosom of his father. Because the war, the fight, was prevailed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Was prevailed. That's why Paul in Thessalonians says, hey, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will live and be made alive. That's why the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is critical. It's critical. Because actually, one of the father was saying, yani, beautiful meditation. He said that the father will look at the son and tell him, who are all these people that you're bringing in your body? Yolo, these are the ones that I have saved. Imagine this beautiful scene. All of us are part of the body of Christ entering paradise and going in. St. Paul in Philippians, he said, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Verse 15 says, uh, this is verse 15, we're going to start describing the second coming. By the way, the description of the second coming is not you know, a lot in the Bible. This is one of the few places. He said, for this way, we say to you by the word of God, the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Here he's answering their question. He's telling, look, you are worried that those who died will not see the, the glorious day of God. He's telling them that's not true. He said, actually, in the contrary, those who died will see the day before you. And he will explain that how, how this happens. By the way, here, here when he says, for, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. When he say by the word of the Lord, it means it was a direct teaching or a prophecy given. And there are two different possibilities how this was given. Either that St. Paul have received it from God himself. You guys know in, in, um, uh, uh, in Corinthians, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night, I in the night he was betrayed, he took bread. So the first person in the New Testament that spoke about the Eucharist was Paul who never attended the Eucharist. But what happened? He saw a revelation. Jesus explained to him everything happens. It's amazing. Amazing. And then even in, in Galatians 1-12, he said, I did not receive it from any man, the teaching, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So it, most likely, he received what he's about to tell us directly from our Lord Jesus Christ. Or it could be a common knowledge at that time and the writers of the Gospels did not want to write it to be repetitive. Because I, as I told you, this is the very first letter that was written. It was written roughly in the year of 51, before any of the other Gospels that were written. So when he says the word of the Lord, this is the, by the way, if you look even in the Gospels, the only verse that is very close to what he's about to explain is in Matthew 24, 31. He said, and he will send out angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's the closest he will get. This is the closest eh, he will get. And he was telling here, it's a little confusing. He said, who, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. And he's telling them, look, those who die will precede us, come and enjoy the glorious day of God before us, we who are living. Why is this important? You might say, well, how does Paul that he know he will be living until the second come, coming? A lot of people say there are two different ideas. One, that people in the early church had a very strong feeling, very strong feeling that Christ is coming very, very soon. I'll tell you something. What happened in the ascension? 
Jesus ascended, right? And then the disciples are looking up. And then an angel came to them and told them, why are you looking up? The same Jesus that went, as you saw him, he will come back, back again. You will see him coming back again the same way. So a lot of the disciples in their minds, Jesus is coming soon. Had to even St. Peter in First Peter four in First Peter four he says, hey, for the, for this time of judgment, the time of judgment, that what our Lord Jesus Christ he said, I did not come to judge but to save. Time of judgment is the second coming. He said, it is time of judgment. So a lot of the fathers of the church initially, the apostles, they thought the kingdom is coming now. They will live to see the kingdom of God. Later on, Taban, that was a feeling. It was not a revelation. It was not something that God have told them. It was their feeling. That's why later on, in Second Thessalonians, St. Paul said, eh, I have fought the good fight. I kept the faith. And, they have, and uh, the crown of righteousness have been prepared for me. And the second, but at the end of his life, he knew that he was, eh, he was going to die. And St. Peter, the same thing. St. Peter, in, uh, in uh, Second Peter, He's, he's telling them, knowingly that shortly I must put off my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. For both of them later on realized that eh, they're not going to live until the coming of Christ. They're not going to live until the coming of Christ. So when the Christ comes, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes, there will be believers. Because he said, those who believe, they will be present. Those who believe will be, will, will be present. So what will happen to those who died? As I've told you in Philippians chapter 3.20, he spoke at it. He said, uh, he's, he's saying, but our citizenship in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior, and then he says, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So what's gonna happen, those who died, when the second coming comes, they will be awakened with a glorious body. Those who preceded us, when the second coming come, look at uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, hey, listen, I tell you a mystery. St. Paul says, I'm gonna tell you a secret. Listen to the secret. He said, we will not all asleep. In the second coming, we'll not all be dead. But we all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has closed with its imperishable and the immortal with the, immort with the, the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. What is he saying? He's saying at the second coming, two things will happen. One, those who were dead will rise in a glorious body. So what about us who are living? He said in a twinkling of an eye, like this you'll be transformed to a glorious body. He will explain it now clearer in verse 16. What is he saying in verse 16? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an angel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead will rise in Christ. This verse is beautiful. Look at this. Who's coming? Who's coming in the second coming? The Lord himself. Only few things in life God has only decided to do by himself. Creation, salvation, and second coming. That shows you how valuable that day for God is. God says, I am coming myself, my friends. Especially for you. And then look, Mishbasa coming, kida, ha, something extra. Nah. Coming, look, we're like, hey, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. Who's shouting? Who's shouting? God. God Himself is shouting. Yeah, and hey, God Himself is shouting. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the word shout means cried with a loud voice. In His life, 
Jesus cried with a loud voice two times. One time in the life of Lazarus, he cried out with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come out. And the second time, he cried out on the cross. He said, in your hands, I deliver my soul. Why? Let me tell you something about the shouts or the voice, the cry. This is exactly the same word that a soldier or a leader or a commander would use in the time of victory. The same shout, the same cry that our Lord Jesus cried, cried at the Lazarus, cried at the crucifixion, is the same cry of victory. We all know that Lazarus prefigured what's going to happen to Christ. And he was given a small play or a small symbolism of what's going to happen to Christ. So our Lord Jesus Christ shouted of victory at death. Shouted with victory at death. They're going to tell me something, Abuna. How come God did not shout at his resurrection? Resurrection is a, is a big deal. Why only shout at his death? Because there is one more enemy that has not yet been prevailed. If you look in 1 Corinthians 15, it said, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. God says, look, yes, I prevailed. Yes, you can go to paradise. Yes, all these things are happening, but my children still die. They don't have the glorified body yet. They have not enjoyed the heavenly life in the kingdom, but in, in paradise in heaven yet. So the last enemy has not yet been revealed. So when does God shout the last shout of victory? In the second coming. In the second coming. And obviously, throughout the whole salvation, our family in heaven is standing right by us in every step. Just like from the beginning, the angels looked at the creation of Adam and were rejoicing just like they came at the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. They were at the resurrection. They were at the ascension. Our family, they will also be at the second coming. The, arch, the archangel was, were, were a shout. But back here, with a voice of an archangel. There is a specific archangel. In the, in the Orthodox, in the Coptic Church, we have a tradition. There is an angel that we always draw him with a trumpet. Okay? Some people say he's archangel Suriel. Okay? So he is the one who will, eh, he will play the trumpet the last minute. And by the way, if you look at the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and, and, uh, when you look at the presence of God, even in the Old Testament, in Exodus, for example, 19, they said there was a great voice of trumpet that made everybody fearful. That made everybody fearful. So here it said, well, okay, and those who died in Christ will rise first. Those who died in Christ or rise a first. So after, after this, after what happened in the second in the second coming, those who died in Christ will rise in glorified body. And then what's going to happen to them? They will be coming with our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven on a cloud. It's a party, celebration, trumpet, and the angels happy and celebrating, and a big event. And then what's going to happen? Look here. He says. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I want to stop here for a little bit. If you open Matthew 24, what does it say? This is our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. How does the Son of Man look? Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women 
will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other will be left. Very scary verse. What does it mean? Two people will be serving. One will be taken on the cloud and the other will be left. Two people will be married. One will be taken on the cloud and one person will be left. I love this verse because it's telling you two people are doing exactly the same task. One will be taken and the other will be left. One will be taken and the other will be left. So what happens is our Lord Jesus Christ is coming from the clouds with the righteous who rose first with him coming in the air, coming in there. And then what's going to happen? Us who are the righteous, who are living in a twinkling of an eye, like he said in Corinthian, they will turn to be glorified and they will be taken in clouds. Here he says, eh, be taken in clouds. Imagine get the clouds going throughout the whole world, taking all the righteous, glorified body, and they go meet with our Lord Jesus Christ. Where are they meeting Jesus? Where are they meeting him? They are meeting him in the air. Why the air? Wait until you're coming. Why? Why the air? Because the Bible describes, our Lord Jesus Christ describes the, the devil as the prince of the world. So who has his throne in the air? The devil. God said, no more. That's it. The shout of victory. My children are victorious over your throne. Here you go. A beautiful day. A beautiful scene. When we can meet truly our family in heaven with joy, with praises, with singing. Praises that comes just unintentionally. Joy that you cannot explain comes in that day, comes in that day. And then he said, eh, once you meet him in the cloud, and you shall always be with the Lord. And you shall always be with the Lord. That's it. No more death, nothing to separate you. In heaven, my friends, we will get to know everybody. Some people tell you in heaven, an angel will come and introduce you to the saints. That's yani, eh, nonsense, okay? In heaven, you will know. How did the disciples know Elijah and Moses? How did the rich man know Abraham? Did an angel come to the Hades and told him, this is Abraham? La. These are your family. How are we going to know them? We do not know. It's a mystery. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. It's a secret. I can't tell you everything. Part of it because he himself probably does not know. And then he says, there's, there's yani, an important idea I want to also focus on. A lot of people say in heaven, the Christian understanding of heaven is different than a lot of other people how they understand heaven. And what happens when you tell people in heaven you'll be joyful and praising God and all these happy things, they tell you this is going to be very boring. They don't understand anything. Why? Because before you ask, before you ask, before you ask and compare and measure how is heaven will be like you have to you ask yourself a very important question. How are you going to be like? This glorious body that you have, what would it desire? If I bring a young child and tell him, come attend the Bible study with us here. Hi, Emily. I have two minutes and then he's going to come play with the microphone, jump around, run around, and he was going to leave. That's normal. It's a child. He wants candy, he wants chocolate, he wants things like that. It's normal. As you grow, what you desire changes. As you transform to a glorious body, what you desire changes. What you desire changes. One person recently, they were asking God for something very specific, something spiritual. Yeah. For God delayed it so much, and he gave it to them at a time unexpected. So she came to me and told me, Abuna, 
the timing of God was 10,000 times my better than my time. And then she said something so beautiful. She told me, if the earthly gifts from God are so sweet like that, how about the heavenly gifts? How about the heavenly gifts? If in liturgy, every once in a while, you get a glimpse at how heaven looks like. If every time when you serve one of your fellow friends, you feel the love and the joy. If every time, even earthly pleasures, if earthly pleasures looks like that, how about the heavenly? How about the heavenly? And then he ends Kida with something so beautiful. He says, uh, he says, therefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Touch Kida, don't go to people when they are suffering in pain and give them your wisdom. No, 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 no. Tell them, let me show you how heaven is gonna look like. Let me show you how we're gonna meet Christ on the clouds. Let me show you how the angels will be joyful and the trumpets will be playing. Let me show you how our glorious life will look in heaven. Don't speak your own words. Speak the words of God. Speak the words of God. Let's go take one verse from chapter 15 really quick. Obviously, a very important question after Paul told them this beautiful vision about what's gonna happen in the second coming, so if me and you, the first thing we're gonna tell him, hey, when, when is all this gonna happen? We wanna know, right? This is so beautiful, this is the moment we're waiting for. Then in chapter 15, he start, uh, five, uh, chapter five, he starts the first verse told me, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourself know per perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night. In Greek, there's two different words for time. There's a word called chronos, which means specific, exactly chronological time. And there's a word called kreus. Kreus, which means the right time, the exact time. So Paul here is telling them that, look, there is a time where the kreus will become the chronos. Sorry. But I just want to, because the, the language here is shoya limiting. He said him there is a time where the, 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 the promise of God will become your actual clock time. But he's telling them, look, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, I don't need to tell you. I don't need to tell you. Because Paul have already talked to them about this. There is a difference between time and season. Time is a time where, you know, morning, night, where you go. Season is different season in your life. There is a season where you're going to be single. There is a season where you're going to be married. A season where you're going to have children. There is a season where you're going to be sick. There is a season where you're going to die. There are seasons where you're going to have financial struggle, like a lot of you guys in college now. Okay? And there is a season where hopefully you'll be comfortable. Okay? There is a season where you're going to work hard. And there is a season where you're going to actually have hard work to do uh, vacations and rest full time so here he's telling them regarding the time and the seasons don't really think about it too much okay why because the time comes at a thief in the midst of the night i'm not going to talk about this second verse i'm going to talk about it next time so we can take some questions and glory be to god for